a sink. I think I have more bugs um, presented um, in the slides than the proceedings, but uh, you should be able to follow it with the proceedings as well. Um, so my presentation for today, kernel auditing and exploitation. Um, so there are three uh, parts to this presentation. Um, at the end of each part will be questions and whatnot. Um, the first part is kernel auditing research. Um, the second part, just a sample of exploitable bugs. Um, and the third part will be um, the exploitation of uh, various bugs. Um, like I said, uh, questions at the end of each section, but jump in you know, if you've got any questions uh, in any part. So part one is kernel auditing research. Uh, just an overview of uh, the auditing work that I've done in the past. Uh, it was uh, this particular audit, uh, manual audit uh, of the open source kernels. Uh, the open source kernels in question being FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD and Linux. And the reason for these was uh, primarily just availability. Um, you can download the sources, so why not audit them? <laughs> um, and the auditing was for about three months. Uh, it was part-time, uh, not a full-time audit. Like, didn't spend all my day auditing code, but when I had free time, go ahead and audit some. So it was July to September last year. Um, it seems, you know, slightly outdated, I suppose, but it's not really. A lot of these, uh, a lot of things still apply. Um, there's even some zero day which I presented a couple of months ago, which still uh, never got fixed. Uh, it's a lot of interesting things to talk about. Uh, just to give a time frame of uh, the auditing that I did um, on each operating system, uh, NetBSD was about uh, a bit under a week. Uh, FreeBSD also a bit under a week. OpenBSD just not too long. And Linux was pretty much the rest of my free time. And the reason for this was um, I use Linux a lot, so I don't know. I suppose I was a bit biased and wanted to audit it more. Um, so what prior work has there been done on uh, kernel source in terms of auditing and vulnerabilities? Uh, Dawson Engler, uh, in the past couple of years, has released some great papers uh, with automated bug checking, uh, like uh, the Stanford Bug Checker, uh, it, which it's commonly referred to, uh, the automated bug discovery that Dawson Engler's worked on. Um, it's been run against uh, various open source kernels, and they've found a large number of bugs, actually, um, through automated means. <laughs> uh, just, I was just getting some weird... Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, the Dawson Engler's work um, found a lot of concurrency issues uh, and synchronization issues. So we're looking at things like uh, double locks, double unlocks, uh, found a lot of those. Uh, also did a lot of things on double freeze as well, um, found a lot of those. Um, did find some buffer overflows, but um, in my opinion, um, the, the most bugs that came out of the, the Stanford bug checker were in relation to concurrency. Um, some, all, some other prior work as well is the Linux kernel auditing project. I've got a question mark at the, at the end of that because you know, as far as I can see, um, the Linux kernel auditing project, or LCAP, um, really, it didn't, really didn't do anything. Um, I, I don't see that you know, it's, you know, the, the Linux kernel has been really audited. Um, I think LCAP released maybe two advisories, uh, and the mailing list is about three, you know, not so many comments, and most of them seem to be saying, you know, let's audit the kernel. Uh, you know, there isn't actually auditing there, it's just let's audit the kernel. Uh, so that's, 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 a bit, that's a bit unusual, I think. Uh, just some, some notes for the presentation. Uh, when I'm talking about bugs, I'm, I'm just really referring to vulnerabilities and security bugs. Uh, I, I like the word bug for, I don't want to say vulnerability for every single bug. Um, so unless I say otherwise, every bug is in relation to security. Uh, after, a, after three months, uh, at least 100, maybe um, up to 150 um, bugs were patched um, in various kernels, uh, across all the kernels. Um, still a lot of bugs in there, um, but you know, see how it goes. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, there seems to be a lot of, you know, myths about, you know, the kernel and stuff. It's, um, and, you know, I've talked about this, like, kernel security mythology, um, you know, it seems that people think that kernels are written by security experts and, and programming gods, and there are great programmers, you know, working on these kernels, like, there's no doubt about this. But when looking at tens of millions of lines of code, um, you know, the follow-up to, 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 this, to this myth is, you know, therefore, you know, kernels don't have simplistic security bugs. You know, they don't have security bugs, and if they do have security bugs, they're just, you know, they're not simplistic. Um, and I'll try to show, like, evidence to, 
that, that contradicts you know, these myths as, as we go on. Uh, another myth, which is just a follow-up on the first one, is that you know, basically a rewrite of the first one, that kernels don't have you know, simplistic security bugs. Therefore, you know, only security experts or programming guides can find them. You know, maybe you see something in a, you know, an advisory that says, not even any advisories to be honest, um, you know, something that says you, know, you have to do this in a certain condition if you know, all these things apply at once, maybe you know, it will be vulnerable. And it seems not to be the case. There are a lot of simple ways to exploit uh, kernels. Uh, another myth, this is the third and final myth that I'm going to talk about, is you know, if kernels are buggy, they must be you know, so difficult to exploit. And you know, therefore, um, you know, exploitation is probably just theoretical. You know, maybe you can do this, and maybe it's possible, but you know, so many conditions are required to, to, to cause you know, um, exploitation. And for me, that doesn't seem to be the case from, from, from my experience. Um, so I'm basically putting forward some conjectures um, you know, at the start of the auditing um, project, let's say. Um, you know, kernel code, it's not special. It's just another program, a really big program, but just another program. Um, it's written in a language with known problems. It's, you know, all the open source kernels are written in C. Um, and C has known problems that time and time again, you're going to see you know, buffer overflows. Um, you're going to see integer overflows. You're going to see a lot of problems. Um, if we look at kernel programmers too, they're just people, um, and sometimes they do make mistakes. Um, you know, it's it's sort of it's hard to say to someone, you know, 10 million lines in a in a kernel. Are you sure 100% that you know that you didn't just skip something or overlook something while writing it? So the way I went about auditing um, was that I'd only audit for simple classes of bugs. I wasn't looking for you know incredibly complicated attacks. Um, if we look back like in the past uh, month or so, two months I think, um, there was a paper that was released about um, hashing collision attacks. If we could um, send, no, for example, Linux, if we could send a certain sequence of packets, um, these will all, you know, when they're hashed, they'll all collide and essentially uh, the complexity of a search would, you know, break down into a link list, uh, you know, a link list search and linear time. And, you know, this was like, you know, this was an, an attack here. Um, you know, I'm not looking for such complicated attacks. Um, looking for simple attacks that you know, easy, easy to find, easy to grab for. Um, and incidentally, with the hashing um, uh, collisions, a, a while ago actually, Solar Designer, um, in one of the earlier fracks, uh, also talked about hashing collisions. Um, you know, very briefly, uh, but talked about um, when writing ScanLogD, um, that one possible attack on it and attack on all IDSs was that if you construct certain sequences of, you know, of packets or data, then you'd have these hashing collisions and the complexity you know, would, would get really bad. <laughs> you know, the, everything would be a worst case scenario. Um, the, the paper release in the past few months was, was really good and really um, strong mathematically, but, but again, I'm not going for those attacks. Um, as with most audits, I suppose, uh, you know, as you start to audit, you start to you know, see patterns or start to see, you know, classes of bugs that lead on to other bugs, um, and you start to generalize of what might be another attack um, or a class of attack. Um, so if you look at just um, uh, some of the experience that um, was attained, I suppose, um, system, you know, system calls are simple entry points in the kernel. This is really what we, you know, what I'm grepping for, you know, looking for entry points in the kernel which are easily controlled by user land. System calls are, you know, the obvious one. Um, and in, in some ways, possibly they're overused by people that, um, that are looking to audit the kernel. Um, um, if we look at device drivers as well, uh, basically, uh, you know, these are by design simple entry points into the kernel. Device drivers for Unix, um, you know, everything is a file, easy access uh, to the hardware uh, through a file. And some people, I suppose, would argue that, you know, you know the one of the downfalls of Unix, <laughs> and you know, um, was IACTLs. IACTLs are just so general purpose. They're you know Swiss Army knife. They do everything under the sun, um, and it seems that you know IACTLs tend to be a big problem uh, in terms of the number of bugs uh, when implemented in device drivers. Device drivers, in my opinion, seem to be the most buggy uh, parts of the kernel. Core kernel code seems pretty good, uh, but the number of device drivers out there that have bugs are just amazing. It's, um, so, immediate results um, since started auditing. Um, first bug, uh, found within hours. Um, and this was true for all the operating systems that um, were audited. Um, and it's arguable 
that uh, the first bug is often the hardest to find. Um, but also uh, must be taken into account that it was a targeted, you know, targeted audit. I was looking for specific, you know, bugs. I wasn't just starting at init.c and, and working downwards. Um, so some observations. Um, there does seem to be, uh, you know, varying degrees of uh, quality, uh, code quality, and hence security bugs. Uh, again, core kernel code seems to be pretty well written. Um, device drivers, uh, anyone can really submit in a device driver for a particular piece of hardware. Uh, and you know you can't really guarantee that. Uh, it, seem, it, it seems to be a lot of bugs in the device drivers. Uh, okay, here's an interesting thing. Um, bugs, in, you know, they seem to exhibit this site, this um, uh, this site of propagation in, in the sense that uh, if you have a bit of source and uh, it becomes the reference source, everyone uses this source as the base source to how to write something. And this reference source has a bug in it. Um, this bug now seems to just, you know verge into other parts of the sources. Uh, and clustering also, it's uh, in the sense that it seems that uh, once you find uh, bugs in a particular area of the source, uh, more bugs are, are close to that area. Um, and this is really like um, just supporting uh, the work of Dawson Engler and automated bug checking. Uh, and that's why I've got the asterisk there because there's another slide shortly after. Uh, there are identical bugs in all platforms. Some of the, some of the code is uh, basically the same in every platform, and some of the bugs are exactly the same. Um, and I, sh I should have uh, slides to show this as well. Um, I do have some bias in uh, my auditing, of course, um, because manual auditing is inherently biased. You know, maybe, you know, I believe that you know, the core kernel code is secure. That's why I'm not finding any bugs there. Maybe I think it's just device drivers um, that are buggy, and you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can't you know, definitively say, um, you know, that this is true, I can just show evidence to, to support you know, what I'm trying to put forward. Um, Dawson Engler's work, on the other hand, is automated um, and avoids the bias of uh, manual auditing. Um, so here are some observations. Uh, this is going back to the, there are, there are the same bugs in all platforms. Um, so what we have here is NetBSD and OpenBSD. Uh, and I should actually say that um, I haven't included enough information here to actually to, to, to show people that this is exploited one. It was actually um, Norman uh, over there uh, came up to me earlier today and, uh, and said, where is, where is the bug here? Um, so if we look at uh, start and num, start and num are both uh, signed uh, integers. Um, so the basic idea is that we make start plus num uh, a value that wraps around into the negatives. Um, Later on after this code, we have a buffer overflow um, that uses uh, the result of uh, you know, num or start. Um, it's a bad, a bad example because I don't show the buffer overflow here, um, but integer overflows are you know, pretty much everywhere. Um, and we've got plenty more to show. Um, so I'll show some evidence in just contradiction to the kernel mess that I presented. Um, kernels aren't written by gods. They are written by people, extremely talented people um, in, in, in many cases, but you know, still people. Um, the initial bugs are found in all hours, um, found in hours by, by in, in all kernels. Um, it should be in all kernels, I suppose. <laughs> um, bugs were found in large quantities. Um, 10 to 30 per day was not a um, OpenBSC was only you know, a couple days of auditing, and there were you know, you know, a reasonable amount of bugs were found in that. Um, likewise for NetBSD. In some, you know, if you do go looking for, for bugs in the kernel, you will find them. Um, uh, 2.6 uh, test. Um, Kernels, I do believe, um, do have some um, some quite you know similar bugs to the 2.4 kernels and the 2.2 kernels. Um, there's a lot of bugs that are still out there. Um, now, here's something interesting. Um, in some parts of the code, we saw inline documentation uh, that state of the code was secure, and in fact, um, you know, it, often it wasn't. And I'll just show this. Um, I don't think you have this in the proceedings, but it's a pretty it's a pretty funny comment. Um, so basically, this guy has um, written a device driver. Uh, I think it's in the video for Linux uh, code. Uh, so basically, it says, first things first, um, make sure we don't copy more than we have, even if the application wants more. And then he states, that would be a big security embarrassment. And then the very next line, he's got an integer overflow. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so it's two lines later. Uh, it's exploitable with a copy to user. Um, and we can copy um, pretty much arbitrary kernel memory um, back into user land. Um, count is under our control um, in this example. 
Um, likewise, um, we have partial control over secread underscore index, um, and then in our copy to user, providing we make count large enough and we get a wraparound in the first uh, comparison, um, we can copy a very large amount of memory, copy it to user land. So Linux 2.16 has, has another funny comment. Uh, this comment says, this routine does error checking to make sure that all memory accesses are within bounds. Um, and in fact, we ha there's actually multiple problems with this code. Um, buff size is a signed integer. Um, so initially, we just have to make buff size negative. Uh, uh, get user ret on the top, if you guys can see that, um, actually copies uh, from user land. Um, a value into buff size. So we control buff size. And we can make it a negative, um, pass the next test. Um, in the K malloc, we have um, integer overflows anyway. Um, and then down below, we have um, a buffer overflow. So multiple problems with this, even though the comment is you know, to make sure that all memory access is within, within bounds. Um, so I just want to okay, want to show evidence in contradiction to that you know, there aren't any simple uh, kernel bugs. Um, you know, almost never, you know, was I required to do like intensive code tracking, um, grepping for bugs, grepping for likely places to exploit. Um, you know, found a lot of found a lot of things. Um, very close to it, you know, grep for a you know copy to user copy from user copy and copy out. You know, right above there, look for something that you know might be buggy and, and hence probably exploitable. Um, and in some cases, no input validation at all. Um, even inline documentation shows that non-working code you know, exists in many places. Um, so this is uh, ibcs2 underscore stat.c. Um, basically, uh, we're doing a copy out at the bottom. Uh, this is a, this actually, this code applies to all, all the open source kernels. It's similar pretty much in every one. Uh, we do a copy out with, of len bytes. And len has just no input validation at all. You can, put anything you want for len and copy arbitrary memory back to user space. Um, we have a, another case where um, this looks like to be NetBSD or um, OpenBSD. Um, some of the drivers share bugs and I should have I should have put which OS they really all apply to but it's NetBSD or OpenBSD here. Um, if we look at count, we do a copy out with count. Um, count comes, this copy out is called basically from an IACTL. Um, there's no input validation on count at all. We can copy arbitrary memory again. Um, we do have to be on the console, which, uh, s you know, that's, uh, it's not too bad at that point, but essentially there's just no, no input validation. Um, this is a good bug in Linux. It's actually, well, a bad bug, I suppose. Um, the, I actually released this bug and an exploit for it um, a few months ago at RuxCon. Um, so it's never been fixed since. It's never been fixed. Um, we have XXX untested. Um, we have, um, and basically, uh, the code below cannot possibly work. The arguments are wrong. Um, it should panic the kernel if this code ever gets called. Um, I suppose it's, okay, just before I, you know, it sounds like I'm really bagging the kernels here. Um, but in general, they you know they're they're pretty they're, they're pretty good I think and you know vendor response was excellent. Um, so many bugs were fixed um, and really if we think that other code doesn't have problems, um, you know very naive as well. Um, so it's, I'm showing some examples here that you know there are you know such simple bugs um, as there are you know in many you know much software out there. Um, so I just I just wanted to say that before <laughs> before going too much into into bagging. In, you know, any kernels, because I, I do think the open source is uh, pretty good. Um, so, some more evidence in contradiction to the kernel mythology. Um, you know, if kernels are buggy, you know, they, they are sometimes you know, reasonably simple to exploit. Um, to read arbitrary memory from uh, the procfs, using the procfs actually, um, in Linux 2.2 and 2. early 2.4, well, most of the 2.4s actually, um, 38 lines of C and it's 100% reliable. Um, likewise, for FreeBSD Accept uh, system call, which an advisory was released last year, um, 37 lines of C and 100% reliable also. Um, incidentally, um, the Linux people do have the exploit for the procfs code. Um, I did send it to them, um, and I also did send uh, the FreeBSD people the um, Accept uh, exploit as well. And I'll actually show the Accept. 
um, exploit um, later on in the exploitation part. Um, okay, stack overflows. Um, in Linux, for example, they don't require any offsets. Uh, kernel stack overflow does not require offsets. Um, you know, it's pretty reliable. You know. uh, I'll show some shellcode later on, and the only assumption is that the return address that we're, uh, that we're writing, overriding on the stack is word aligned. And that's a pretty good assumption. GCC will word align uh, return addresses. Um, we control user land completely. We control all offsets in user land and addresses in user land pretty much. So you know, there isn't anything to brute force. You know, very reliable. Um, so attack vectors. Um, you know, it's back to if there's more code running and more code accessible, um, you're probably going to be, you know, you're going to have more exposure. Um, so, okay, don't run, you know, bloated generic kernels. Uh, recompile your kernel. Don't, you know, don't compile uh, support for any hardware you're not using. Um, if you have device, you know, a, you know, compatibility with a, you know, a million devices, possibly one of those devices might be um, the software for it might be exploitable. Um, and it's all back to that, you know, entry points that user land can control. You know, th th these are vectors of exploitation. Um, so I've got some examples: device drivers, system calls, file systems. Uh, for example, with file systems, uh, with the procfs bugs uh, that were in Linux, um, if you seek to something like, um, if you open a file in uh, the proc file system that's you know that's readable, and many files are, you could do something like seek to around four gig, just below 32 bits. This is for um, I386 specifically for 32 bits, but it's quite generic. Um, and then if you say read, for example, uh, s something uh, with a count that when added to the file pointer um, will cause an integer overflow. And at that point, many things uh, become exploitable. And it turns out that um, such an attack was uh, um, quite generic against a number of files in the ProcFS for Linux. Um, the vendor response. Um, vendor response was really excellent, to be honest. Um, um, all contact points responded extremely fast. Um, yeah. Theodore uh, did respond in under three minutes. Um, I sent an email um, with about a list of 10 to 15 bugs. Um, I turned around to was having a conversation, turned back, uh, and received an email from, uh, uh, from uh, Theo uh, with uh, responses to, uh, to those bugs. Um, Alan Cox, I think I put in the proceedings two hours. I do have copies of, of you know, with all these emails and, and massive lists of um, you know bugs that were sent in, um, Alan Cox was you know extremely good. Responded back um, you know, in a couple hours um, with statuses on all these bugs. Initially, I sent um, a list of uh, bugs for 2.2.16 kernel, and the current at the time was something like 2.4.18, um, I think. Um, so Alan Cox could go through all these bugs in 2.2.16 say, um, yes, this has been fixed at this point in time, you know, this one looks, you know, this one is valid, this one doesn't look valid, um, you know, did include a few false positives with my, um, with my auditing, um, and I thought that was a fantastic response by Lee Cox. Um, so even replied that Solid Designer had fixed um, get so and set so bugs back in, you know, back in early, later 2.2 actually, um, you know, from, from a year or two ago. Um, so that was exceptionally good, I thought. Um, I am a bit biased, though, because, uh, you know, I, I really do believe in open source. I do think the vendor response was extremely good in this case, but, you know, I am a bit biased. And, and I suppose it's arguable that, um, you know, I wasn't, I was emailing uh, developers directly, not going through any um, super official contact points. Um, and, you know, they responded back immediately um, discussing code. Okay, a bit more bias. Um, you know, bad, bad joke, but, you know, a lot of hacks in the Linux kernel. Yeah. Okay, it was a bad joke. Okay. <laughs> so there's 106, 106 uh, references to the word hack in, in the credit section. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they like to use this, um, this, this terminology, hacks on, on this part of the code, hacks on that part of the code. Um, so it's pretty funny, though. Um, just to talk about Linux a bit more, Alan Cox was the first person I contacted. Um, he remained personally involved and, and really responsible, you know, for the entire duration. Um, sending a lot of stuff and would, you know, always respond, you know, immediately. Um, you know, would always be, you know, up for to argue over bugs and say, I, you know, I, I don't think that's exploitable. You know, I don't think, you know, that's valid. Um, and, you know, you know, many times we're like, you know, totally right. It's just, you know, ignore that. <laughs> um, um, and Alan Cox did patch the majority of uh, software. He did attribute me uh, with some small, uh, with patches in the change logs. Um, you know, for things like, uh, 
one or two line changes, just uh, doing uh, uh, checks on various signs or various overflows would attribute me to that. But um, ultimately, he did uh, do all the uh, um, pushes back into the mainstream kernel and, and actual writing of the code there. Solar Designer uh, was responsible for the 2.2 kernels. Um, he got involved a bit, uh, a bit later on after initial contact with Alan Cox. Um, so actual Solar Designer was responsible um, in, um, for the 2.2 uh, kernel release, uh, the later one came out, I think, um, last year, I can't remember the month, but um, after like X, X, you know, about a year or something of not releasing 2.2, uh, Solar Designer did backport uh, pretty much all the 2.4 bugs and everything that was applicable, introduced uh, other fixes as well. Dave Miller also helped out later on, uh, did uh, initially work primarily on the Spark stuff, um, does most of the Spark stuff and, and network code as well, um, but also helped generically as well in a number of things. So in my opinion, I think Linux was successful. Uh, Red Hat actually released an advisory uh, last, last year. Um, and they, you know, they, they were actually mentioning the DMCA and saying things like, well, we can't really say what vulnerabilities were fixed, and we can't show you the code because of the DMCA. And if you go to this you know, website, which is outside the US, and you can see the patches that went in. Um, but ultimately, I do think Red Hat, um, and pretty much all the Linux vendors now, um, yeah, have been totally successful. They do regularly release kernel advisories now. Um, and in my opinion, that was probably attributed to the, to the work we did uh, last year. Um, um, it's ironically, the, the, the Linux audit was probably the most complete. Um, um, there was code in there that you know, obviously had never been looked at before. And you know, it's ironic considering that you know, the Linux kernel auditing project was there, but it does seem to uh, have been the most complete, even, even, even if just the sheer number of lines that were looked at. Well, grept at least. Um, FreeBSD uh, has a more formalized uh, process uh, with uh, patching software and uh, security problems uh, as a security officer contact point. Uh, dialogue slightly longer to establish. Uh, it's very effective uh, once you know once up and running. Um, I'm talking about address standardization issues here in this slide, um, and what I'm referring to here is that there was one particular bit of code um, with the accept um, uh, over overflow. Um, and that basically, uh, the from length in the accept system call um, was soc address, um, uh, soc len underscore teal. And basically, this was a, uh, a sign value in the kernel. Um, and really, why would it be signed? Uh, you know, this was a you know, considerable issue. Um, they did change it to be unsigned. Linux with the get soc opt and set soc opt um, kept their soc len underscore t, uh, soc opt len underscore t, sorry, uh, as a sign. And, you know, that's. In my opinion, um, you know, just making things unsigned um, when they have to, you know, when they when they are going to be unsigned solves a lot of issues. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but you know, it seems to be the case. A lot of a lot of sign problems, you know, in a lot of code. Um, so making things unsigned you know, is is actually useful. Um, was FreeBSD a success in terms of you know auditing? I, I don't know. Um, nothing really changed with FreeBSD. Um, they did release an advisory uh, for the, the accept thing. Uh, and at the time, I was working in this vulnerability assessment company. Um, a coworker came up to me and said, oh, you know, I'm, here to, I'm going to implement your vulnerability today. I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? What vulnerability are you talking about here? And he's like, um, FreeBSD have released an advisory. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, so that was, that was pretty unusual, I thought. I, I didn't ask them to, to release anything there, but you know, they did release it, uh, which was, you know, I think, pretty good of FreeBSD. Um, the reason for this square on my slide is because this is OpenOffice and it's a PowerPoint import, and the smiley face didn't didn't go across because it doesn't have a font. <laughs> um, okay, so NetBSD, uh, the dialogue with them was wasn't lengthy, but you know, all issues were resolved. Um, you know, after a small waiting period, I was actually you know, sent them a list of uh, a list of bugs and was watching the change logs to see you know how long it would take before they said, yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll put them in, uh, we'll fix all this. And I was just watching the change logs to see pretty much how many days it would take in. And it seemed that what happened was uh, you know, one of the developers uh, did a bit of like personal QA, then um, you know, ran it on his own box, waited you know, a bit under a week, and then pushed it into like the unstable development version of the, the mainline kernel. And that, that seemed pretty good. Um, the patches, surprisingly enough, there were some shared problems in the drivers between NetBSD and OpenBSD, which isn't really surprising if we consider that um, OpenBSD was initially a fork from NetBSD. Some of the drivers uh, do share, you know, there are, there are shared bugs there. 
um, but the uh, patches just propagated you know, very quickly from NetBSD to OpenBSD. Um, looking at the change logs for OpenBSD, I'll have change logs uh, from NetBSD. Um, so OpenBSD, um, theater app, you know, probably the quickest response, um, you know, in documented history. I've never seen, you know, three minutes um, to, to, you know, to respond to these things. Uh, an OpenBSD select advisory was released um, shortly after that, actually, um, and I didn't actually audit or, you know, report uh, a select overflow. Um, I did pass it a little bit, but I wasn't, like, only looking for simple bugs here, um, and I didn't want to follow the macros. <laughs> um, so, but it seems that, like, the OpenBSD started, you know, doing, you know, auditing after that because Niels Provost uh, released um, an advisory for it, you know, a bit after that time that I sent them a list of kernel bugs there. Um, so, this is sort of interesting, and I suppose it's a small, a small go at, at OpenBSD. Uh, so, if we look at the IBCS code, which I showed before, which had no bounds checking, uh, no um, sanity checking input validation at all, um, it's actually regarded as a, a possible integer overflow. Um, so, I'm not exactly sure, um, you know, where that comes in. There's also another interesting, some other interesting change logs um, when they talk about um, you know, uh, possible integer overflow. Some of these are okay, but have been changed for consistency, um, and you know, they're, they're all exploitable. <laughs> um, so the IBCS2 underscore stat dot C code, um, Linux has fixed it, OpenBSD has fixed it, NetBSD have fixed it, FreeBSD have not fixed it. Um, I don't know why. Um, I really didn't, you know, push after sort of. I didn't really push hard for that, um, and it's, it's still. There's no input validation at all, though. Um, so today, where are we in kernel security? Um, auditing always results in vulnerabilities. Um, it, it always does. Um, and auditing and security, you know, it really should be an ongoing process. You can't just say that, um, you know, audited once, hence, you know, secure indefinitely. Uh, you really do have to audit it, you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, and there's certainly, you know, a lot more bugs than I'll describe today, and you know, many ways of exploiting a kernel that. That I will describe today as well, but you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, about four months ago, um, released uh, you know most of the you know the technical results, lots of bugs, lots of patches, uh, and I released uh, some an exploit for the cough binary loader for current Linux at the time and current Linux today. Also uh, released. Uh, also showed the uh, IB uh, the stat.c code, which just had a couple of slides ago, um, but you know they're, they're still present today in, in all the, you know in the kernels talked about. Um, so you know it's a bit of a bit of a question there. You know, does anyone read you know conference material besides us? If you're not at the conference, will it get fixed? Um, so that sort of is the conclusion of my first part, uh, the first part of my presentation. Are there any questions? No, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, so um, uh, Dave asked me if uh, the, the cough binary loader is default um, on Linux. No, it is not default. A lot of the stuff that I'm presenting isn't default. Um, like if we look at, um, there are bugs in like, uh, like the elf loader has some integer overflows, but um, I have not exploited or, you know, exploited anything um, to any great extent. And there are some problems that seem Theoretical that that should seek further investigation to see how they'll go. Um, the a dot out loader um, has some integer overflows as well that had actually a bug fixed in it uh, last year as well. Um, with you could escape R limits um, due to various integer overflows there. The a dot out code actually has so many integer overflows, but most of them are just you know integer overflows and they don't do anything. Um, I think like um, I've only looked at the Linux code for the the shell script parsing, like basically um, when you uh, try to, uh, when the kernel looks at a binary or a shell script and it tries to pass the hash bang, um, it actually does a lot of work because there's like there's white space, there are tabs, um, and it has to fit some certain requirement before it can execute this shell script. So I think maybe um, in, other, in other systems it might be exploited because, you know, it's, it's always a bit scary when you know, there's parsing involved of, you know, of weird stuff in the kernel. Okay.
So the next part of my presentation is just a, a sample of exploitable kernel bugs. Um, so I've got actually um, more on my slides than I do on the proceedings, um, but you know, there's some interesting ones in here. Um, this was one that you know, showed earlier, um, and this also isn't um, by default in OpenBSD. It has an ifdef user LDT. Um, so it, I, I talked about this a bit before, and I should have included more, and it's the worst um, presented bug that I've got here since it doesn't show all the, um, the features that make it exploitable. Um, start plus num can overflow to get um, sign conversion. Um, so we can actually make that a negative. U start plus, uh, plus num becomes a negative value, which will be less than 8192. And later on in the code, there will be a buffer overflow there. Uh, this one is, this one is a, a good um, integer overflow because this, this one has occurred in um, a lot of drivers in OpenBSD and NetBSD. So we make a check um, at the top. Can everyone see that okay? I'll, I'll assume so. <laughs> um, uh, we make a check that you know, if count, you know, if it's zero or um, index is greater than or equal to 256, then you know, we return. But you know, index plus count, um, count is basically any large value at this point, any number not zero. Um, so we can make count you know, something like uint max and make index one, um, make it one, and then we'll get an integer overflow uh, at the highlighted line. Um, Later on, we'll have a copy out using count, um, which is our large value. Um, and then we'll have a, um, a memory disclosure um, for the driver, uh, for the kernel in general, actually. Um, another one here. Um, this, one, this one has another integer overflow. And it's a, it's a good integer overflow because it shows like a common, a common class of bugs that um, people are you know, allocating memory using one expression. And then later on, they'll do a copy, you know, copy a buffer using another expression. Um, and it seems that you know, it always causes problems when people you know, are using two different expressions you know, when they want to do the same thing. You know, in the first case, we can get an integer overflow and produce a small value. In the second case, we can, um, we can use a large, you know, we get a large value. Um, it, that, you know, this always causes problems in all code. Um, as soon as you have like checks using one expression and copies using another, um, you know, it's a very likely place of uh, of compromise. Um, this one here, we have a, a sign problem. Um, we take the minimum value of a syscall argument um, and another value. Um, and it turns out that length is a, is a signed value. So we can make length um, a negative, and it will turn out to be the minimum. Um, so we'll have a negative value, which turns into a large positive value uh, in the buffer copy. Um, and we'll have another buffer overflow copying uh, memory back into userland. Um, this one here is um, is good in the sense because uh, we have count time, you know, we have a times b, um, and this we can get an integer overflow to occur, uh, make it a small value, and then later on we'll do an iteration using one of those values, um, which can conceivably be very large, um, and in our first case uh, we'll have a very small result. So we have you know inconsistencies in in, in what they think is happening. Um, the actual the bug here occurs, of course, um, in, in the loop itself, since uh, count can be a very large, and count times size of block info, we can be, you know, can become an integer overflow there. Um, if we control uh, count, uh, which we do, although I might have a, I think I've skipped uh, some of that code there. Um, okay, so like a lot of these uh, bugs, I was uh, are just slightly modified versions of uh, um, uh, sources that I sent developers directly. Um, but it's been modified for, you know, for presentation today. Um, this one, again, is uh, very much like the last one. We have a syscall argument called dev, which is a signed integer. Um, and then down below, we have a comparison that says um, if this value, of, you know, this value dev is greater than you know, host name length, um, you know, then bad things happen. But if we make you know, dev a negative value, um, then we can pass that check, no problems. And when we go to the copy out just below it, uh, we have a very large value um, copied um, uh, buffer overflow again. I should also include that host name len is a signed value here. Um, there are problems if you do things like comparing uh, signed and unsigned because you'll have like a signed conversion. Um, uh, if you compare a signed value and an unsigned value um, and they're both of the same rank, like a signed int and an unsigned int, uh, better example, a signed int and a size of. 
um, what, what happens uh, in GCC at least, um, and this apparently is part of the specs, um, is that the signed value will be converted to unsigned. Um, so in some cases that saves code, in some cases it breaks code. Um, the specs are pretty, are pretty ambiguous at this point. They say that size of return size t, and size t is just some unsigned, you know, an unsigned integral of unsigned integral type. Doesn't say if it's a short or a long, um, or, or what it is. So, you know, it's it's an ambigu ambiguity of the specs here, in my opinion, um, because if you do something like compare a short, uh, a long signed with an just an unsigned int, then you won't have the signed conversion. Um, so it's 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 a bit ambiguous in my opinion, and it does cause problems. Um, I haven't talked about that too much here, so it's it's not really you know necessary for the rest of the presentation. Um, if we look at this code here, um, we have a power write file, which is part of a device driver. Um, presumably, uh, now presumably you have to be a super user to do this, uh, since typically you would have uh, file permissions um, stopping arbitrary users from um, from writing to to such a configuration file or so forth. Um, but if we look at if count is less than or equal to zero, um, the actual the less than zero is quite redundant since um, count is unsigned to begin with. So it will never be less than zero. Um, GCC will just uh, not include this part of the code um, in the code generation. Uh, doesn't warn about it either. So it's, you know, silently delete stuff, which, which is, you know, quite fine, but it would be nice to have a warning or something. Um, so basically, for this one, if we make um, count um, of size u int max, um, when we have count plus one, we'll get an integer overflow, and we'll allocate zero bytes. Um, and in the kernel, we will actually get a successful result. It will uh, return something. Um, and then we go to copy from user. Count being of u int max size um, will be a buffer overflow there. Um, it's probably going to panic the kernel there. But again, it's only for super user. Um, but it, it, it's a good example of, of some of the bugs that that are seen. Uh, okay, I'm, I think I'm running really, really, going really slow. I, well, not really slow, but I'm running really long here. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so uh, if we look at um, this, this one here, um, this is an interesting bug because it's, uh, it affects much of Linux 2.2, 2.4. Um, so we have int off equals, and we cast uh, the offset. Um, and we have a comment next to it saying, avoid useless 64-bit arithmetic. Uh, now, this is, this is a problem that I was mentioning earlier when we have a 32-bit file pointer, um, and we seek to just around, you know, just around 4 gig, uh, and then we try to read something that will cause an integer overflow. So when we have off plus count here, um, the offset we can control by an lseek, and the count we can control by just a read. Um, so in this case, we will get um, an integer overflow in off plus count, um, and essentially um, uh, do a copy to user down below uh, with, uh, with really count that's under our control. Um, so if they, if they had actually um, deleted that line that said avoid useless 64-bit arithmetic, um, they would have been safer, um, but not entirely safe, because I think in the next example, actually, no, I will just go back. Um, uh, if we are, you know, on 64-bit architectures, count can also be 64-bit. Size t can be 64-bit. So if we have um, the offset, uh, the file position, the file offset is 64-bit, um, and on a 64-bit architecture, size t is a 64-bit, we can once again uh, get an integer overflow. So um, you really do need to add, um, you know, a check to say, is there an integer overflow here, as opposed to just keeping everything as 64-bit um, and different architectures that will be exploitable. Um, in this code here, I won't talk about this one for too much. Uh, without going through the details, basically we have, um, we call a function um, using uh, count initially as an unsigned, um, and then in the function that we're calling, it sign converts it to a sign value. Um, and at this point, uh, we can take a minimum again and use this negative value to, you know, to go back to the original function and cause a buffer overflow again. Um, this one is another proc FS bug. Uh, and we have um, off underscore t um, for offset, um, which again is the same problem as before. Um, but the problem here, um, there are a couple of problems, but uh, for starters, uh, they should have used l off underscore t. Um, so it's actually you know, an integer overflow 
plus a prototyping problem here as well. Um, we have the, uh, the get sock opt code that I was talking about earlier. Um, and basically, this is a sign problem again. We're taking a minimum um, of a value that we control, which is our sock length, our sock option length. Um, and we copy to user. This one is a memory disclosure bug also. Um, this one, I'm just going to go through these a bit, like, not so in depth. Um, but you know, if afterwards, uh, you know, it just seems that I'm running really long, so I'm just going to try to get through uh, as quickly as possible. Um, this one, you have to be super user. Um, but the thing with this one, um, if you make length, if you write zero bytes, um, zero minus one will be, you know, uint max, um, and you'll do a copy from user um, with, a, you know, with uint max here. So we have a check to say that if length is greater than line size, then there's a problem, but we don't actually check the case that when length is zero, and it's not normal to, you know, to write zero bytes, but it's, it's quite legitimate. Um, this one is basically a sign problem again. We have short length. It should be unshort length. Um, we have a check. Uh, Rio command dot length. Is it greater than page size? Um, and if we make length a negative, um, we, we end up passing that check and causing a buffer overflow down below. Um, this one is uh, just considered really you know, quite bad code for, for, for most people because they're allocating um, about 1K you know, on the stack in the kernel, which is considered you know, don't allocate you know, such large buffers you know, on a kernel stack. You don't have a lot of room on a kernel stack for uh, Linux i386, you have um, 8K. Um, so you don't want to allocate you know, a, a K just haphazardly. Um, K malloc would have been better, but um, if we make len a negative value, um, we can essentially cause a buffer overflow again. Um, this one, uh, another integer overflow. Um, again, because we're using we're allocating using one, exp one expression, and then we're copying using another expression. Um, this one, I, I think I've got three examples from this one particular file. Um, this one is what I was talking about earlier. In, in a, on a 64-bit architecture, um, even though we have uh, PPOS is 64-bit, um, if we add you know, another 64-bit value to it, we will have an integer overflow. Um, so on 64-bit architectures, exploitable. On 32-bit, not exploitable. Okay. So, um, is there a pause for audience participation? Are there any questions at this point? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, he just asked me a question when doing a copy from user, um, the return value. Um, on this call, um, what will happen if you can't copy uh, that number of bytes due to problems such as um, um, you, know, you have page permission problems or it turns out to be so large that, you know, what will happen? Um, I'm actually at the very next part, I'm going to talk about um, exploitation. Um, it's a good question and um, I've tried to avoid um, the copy uh, from user. Um, exploitation, the, the bugs particularly for that in the sense of um, arbitrary, um, you know, really large buffers. Um, for Linux, you'll, you know, you'll get some, um, some strange issues, uh, you know, when doing copy. So I'll just go through the next, um, the next part of the presentation, which is all about exploitation, and we can come, to, uh, come back to that or after the presentation. Okay. Okay, so part three is kernel exploitation. Okay. Um, I'm just, I, I really do have to, to um, you know, I'm running extremely, extremely long, I suppose. Um, okay. So what exploit classes do we have that's available um, in the kernel? We can have arbitrary code execution, which obviously is, is the one that we're really after. Um, and these, you know, can have, you know, um, uses such as, you know, obviously privilege escalation, but, you know, seemingly better uses such as escaping kernel sandboxing, um, security enhanced Linux, user mode Linux. Um, if we are running in the kernel, um, you know, we, we can, you know, escalate our privilege beyond what we have, you know, beyond just a user land perspective. Um, so we can avoid a lot of, uh, you know, a kernel sandboxing. Um, some other things of interest is like um, digital rights management. Um, say, for example, that we have a kernel that is signed at, you know, one particular version that only does one particular thing, which is um, uh, play a video, play an MP3, um, but doesn't allow you to uh, access from user land or copy it or do anything like this. Um, even though we, you know, we've signed this, you know, this version of the kernel or version of this kernel or distro, whatever we want to call it, um, if this software 
has these hidden features such as being exploitable, um, then you know, certainly we can escape the DRM implemented at that level. Um, we're, we're looking at the kernel as our trusted base here. So if we exploit the kernel, then having a signed kernel or a signed user land, uh, okay, maybe trusted path exec execution in userland will help here, but ultimately um, you know, it can break a lot of DRM things. Um, we have a, another, another class of bugs, such as information disclosure. Um, we can read kernel memory. Um, for example, it was a FreeBSC except exploit. Um, and we might want to read things like SSH private keys. Um, root passwords, uh, uh, maybe we won't have so much luck with that, but SSH private keys are certainly probably more plausible. Um, there has been prior work um, done in kernel exploitation. Um, and even though I just have this one slide for prior work, there's actually, you know, there's, there's been other, other work as well, which unfortunately um, you know, I, I don't mention. Um, so if we look at the last frack, we have smashing the kernel stack for fun and profit um, by Noir. Um, and that was an implementation of an exploit from uh, OpenBSD, uh, the select overflow there. Um, there's also been some other stuff done for Solaris, um, uh, also FreeBSD, I think, as well. Um, the Linux execv stuff, of course. Um, uh, the Linux um, elf loader from uh, a while ago with the image overflows and the program headers. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the problem is that people are seeing these as one-offs, you know, one-off bugs. And there's actually a lot of bugs there that, you know, Ten, you know, we're looking at millions and millions of lines of code that you know, no one's really audited. You know, it's, it's pretty open ground there. Uh, and we look at kernel implementation. All the major open source kernels are written in C. Uh, as I said before, language pitfalls are C-centric, not kernel user land centric. So in my opinion, if, you know, if you're going to audit something, um, if you're going to audit code, you shouldn't say, well, I, I shouldn't audit the kernel because it's the kernel. Um, it's, you know, it's the same language here. It's just a big program. Audit it like a user land program. Um, and there is no need to understand you know, in-depth kernel algorithms. You know, implementation is the target of attack here. We're not looking to exploit you know, weird um, you know, algorithms or you know, weird uh, conditions that occur when you know, a million things happen at once. We're just trying to find you know, language implementation attacks, such as buffer overflows, integer overflows, and so forth. Um, C language has uh, you know, well-known pitfalls. Um, an interesting thing, though, C, um, that isn't present in like, other languages, um, in some languages, that it has undefined behavior in certain states. Like if we look at Java, um, probably a bad example here, but um, you know, everything is, you know, even error states you know, are defined. They're defined as being you know, an error state, not an undefined state. Um, so when you have a, you know, a buffer overflow, the raise etc. is an error, not an undefined state. Because in C, you know, undefined generally means exploitable. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the classic problems. Um, you know, error handling, hard or difficult. Um, an interesting thing is um, when, we, when we stop programming in assembler, um, what happens to the carry flag um, when we do addition? Um, the carry flag is, is very, very useful. Um, we, you can't really check in a high level language, um, you know, did, we have an, you know, did we have a carry then? Like, you know, why, don't, why don't we have that? Um, it would be nice, in my opinion. Um, we don't have the exception handlings uh, you know, in initial arithmetic. Um, an interesting thing is uh, things like um, a lot of system calls and libc calls, you know, they, they're both, if we look at malloc, for example, um, malloc returns null on, on failure. Um, null is generally zero, but zero is a valid virtual memory address. Um, there's, you, you can mmap something that's you know, at zero. Um, there's, there's no reason why you can't. If you look at lseek, you can lseek to uint max, um, and it just it should return the, uh, the file pointer, the position, um, position of the file pointer on success. And it does, but it returns negative one indicating success. So you, you, can't, actually, it, it, you can't actually tell at this point. And this is at a kernel level. Um, you know, it's not at libc setting error, no. Uh, the kernel will return, you know, reserves these, res reserves these negative values as errors. So if you else seek, you know, to full gig, it'll do it in the, in, the, in the actual code itself, the FS code itself. But when it returns back to user land, you know, it does return negative one. And you know, libc checking error no, the system call itself. You can't, you know, you can't do anything at this point. You know, in my opinion, like it wouldn't be such a bad idea to have error no, you know, totally in the, you know, controlled by the kernel itself, um, and have thread specific, thread specific data or, or so forth um, that gets set by the kernel. And this would, you know, an out of band error condition. Um, it's unlikely to happen, but it's a bit of a wish list. Um, from what I've seen. Um, integer problems are just, you know, they're everywhere in all C code, you know. Um, they, they really do occur a lot. Um, you know, if, 
if you look at a lot of sorts, you will see the same problems time and time again. Uh, integer, integer overflows are very, very common. Uh, even things for like, you know, checking, you know, checking error conditions, it seems, you know, so simple. Um, but, you know, how many people check for, you know, out of memory, condi out of memory conditions? Um, it's quoted like that, you know, the Linux kernel has no memory leaks. Um, and this is true, you know, in the, in the, you know, the average case, but, you know, there's certainly memory leaks in unusual conditions. Um, and almost all code has memory leaks in unusual conditions if it doesn't, you know, some code will do, you know, if uh, an X malloc and if it's, you know, an allocation failure, it will exit completely. But if something needs to keep on running, you know, pretty much all code, you know, all sizable code, you know, will have memory leaks in weird conditions. Uh, simply cleaning up, you know, the, the allocations that occur beforehand, um, you know, tends to be problematic. Um, so what interfaces do we want to target when we are looking to exploit something in the kernel? Um, the kernel buffer copies, uh, very good place. Uh, this actually, uh, Dawson Engler did uh, a lot of uh, uh, the automated bug checking was very much a bottom-up uh, auditing technique where he did look for kernel buffer copies and then, uh, actually, I apologize, um, he looked uh, at, he did a top-down approach uh, from various uh, entry points into the kernel um, and then once reaching a, a kernel buffer copy, uh, tried to establish if uh, certain, you know, certain things could occur at that point. So if we look at a kernel, kernel buffer copying, uh, kernel and user space can, can really be divided into two conceptual segments, uh, user land and kernel, kernel land. So um, default by 386 Linux, we're looking at three gig for the kernel, and uh, sorry, <laughs> three gig for user land, and uh, one gig for the kernel. Um, and we really need validation um, of our sources and destinations. Uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, the, the code itself will check to say that you're not copying something uh, from, uh, from, let's say, the kernel land to the kernel land itself or user land back in, you know, you have to actually copy from user, has to copy it, should copy it from user land to kernel land. Um, and there are segmentation checks on this to make sure this is the case. Uh, there are also, uh, when we say, for example, we're writing to user land, copying a kernel buffer to a user land buffer, we need to make sure that the user land uh, buffer you know, is addressable. Um, you know, is the page present? Does, you know, uh, does the page have uh, permissions to allow it to write there? Um, and you know, incorrect input validation on these things, uh, you know, can lead to kernel compromises. And really, like, um, you know, input validation, you know, around buffer copying code is the target of exploitation um, that is present in pretty much all kernels. Okay, so I'm going to talk about kernel buffers here, kernel to user space copies. Uh, what can that provide us from an attacker point of view? Um, it can allow kernel memory disclosure. Um, so I presented a lot of examples earlier that if we copy um, something from the kernel to user land, but we don't bound that length, we can actually you know, read arbitrary uh, kernel memory. Um, and this is true because of uh, the case that partial copies of kernel memory and memory. Uh, so if you copy a buffer from kernel land to user land and you give it a very large length, say uint max, uh, you don't actually have to have uint max addressable memory in user space. You can have one page, 20 pages or so forth. Uh, page permissions and a page fault will cause uh, the copy to abort early, but you will have copied that kernel memory to what you have available. Uh, and that's because verification of page permissions, you know, they're not really done prior to the copy. Uh, in Linux, verify area um, can validate that you're copying to somewhere um, that exists but it's mostly deprecated because it's better to use the MMU, um, the memory management, handle that directly. It, sh it will page fault uh, when it tries to write somewhere that it shouldn't. So in effect, you can copy um, large amounts of kernel memory to user land memory, um, even if you don't have four gig of memory free. Um, and I'll, an example here is that I've got the accept system call down below and the from length is actually a negative value that I've given it here. Uh, the from address is actually a buffer um, that is about one gig. Um, okay, that's, that's, a bit, that's a bit large, I must admit. Um, I put it uh, in the BSS because I you know, don't really want to malloc one gig or put one gig on the stack. Um, so the BSS is a reasonable place. Um, you don't actually um, need to page in anything or so forth. Um, actually, 
it will try to copy two gig of memory to the buffer, but it will only fill one gig of memory. Um, it will page fault uh, after copying one gig, return back to accept, um, and should actually return an error. Um, but at this point, we will have copied about one gig of our kernel memory. Okay, so looking at kernel buffers now, uh, again, uh, there are some optimizations that we can do. Let's check the top. Uh, there are some optimizations that we can do. Uh, we don't always have to check segments, so we don't always have to check uh, that the, seg the segments, you know, the, the kernel space, you know, the kernel land is in the kernel land, user land in user land. What we can do is uh, do a verify area initially on a on a buffer, and then we can put bytes directly into that buffer um, without you know any segmentation checks. Um, if the, if the assumptions that we make are incorrect, it's probably exploitable again. Um, we have some classic exploitation here. Basically, we're creating a backdoor. We're going to set up a basically a little kernel module that does a set UID zero um, in a system call. We execute the system call, um, and we get a UID. We get UID zero and privilege escalation. Um, if we can copy you know, this, this kernel shellcode, or run this shell code in kernel context, uh, we can you know, essentially uh, exploit the kernel via this method. Um, what do we do when we want to exploit something? We want to escalate our privileges, uh, and we also want kernel continuation. We want the kernel to continue running without crashing. Uh, privilege escalation, uh, typically by manipulation of the task, uh, task structure, uh, process control block. So we want to change our UID, our GID to zero to be root. Um, classic backdoor. I don't talk about escaping jails or CH root environments, which is another thing that is very useful um, with arbitrary kernel code execution. Um, kernel continuation. Um, if we look at Noir's exploit from FRAC60, um, went to a lot of work to uh, return back into the kernel at a specific address. Um, a specific address that would you know, let the kernel continue running um, without crashing. And in my opinion, this was uh, you know, not not the most optimal way of doing things. Um, it requires you know, a lot of knowledge of, of what's already there. It requires offsets and addresses. Um, you know, essentially, you know, it seems to be an overly complex method. And there are methods that we can use that avoid this problem completely. Um, if we look at Linux 2.4 um, and kernel stacks here, uh, every process uh, pretty much gets an 8K, um, 8K kernel stack um, for i386 Linux. Uh, at the top of this kernel stack, uh, we have our t um, task structure, which is our process control block, containing information about uh, the process that's running. Um, contains information such as our UID, our GID, um, and so forth. It's you know, very essential. Um, the task structure, um, the current task structure, is relative to our stack pointer. Um, so we can actually, once we're running in the kernel, uh, we can look at our stack pointer, and we can get our task structure immediately. And we do that by masking off the lower bits. And this will give us our, the top of the stack in our kernel stack. Um, and, okay. the, the next thing I want to talk about is ret from syscall. Basically, return from syscall. If we look at Noir's exploit again, um, returns back into the kernel, and the kernel eventually calls you know, return from syscall or so forth. Uh, but why don't we just call that ourselves? Why don't we implement that ourselves? Um, so if you look at uh, Linux again, um, it implements you know, returning to user land with an IRAT. Um, the code itself is in entry.s. Um, very small amount of code. Um, and that will essentially return us from a kernel context into a user land context. Uh, where we return back in user land, totally under our control. We control the program counter uh, that we return to user land. Um, so you know, we don't really want the system call that we're exploiting you know, to, to continue working and you know, to write something to a device or something like this. We want it just to return back to user land Give us a shell, maybe that's UID zero, and have the you know the kernel run like normal. So that's basically what I'm saying in this slide. <laughs> um, so I'm um, going to look at uh, the exploitation of bin format cough.c a bit more. Um, basically, it's an arbitrary copy from user space um, from disk, um, which is under our control. We can just write a binary. Um, and copies it to really anywhere in kernel space. It's under our control. Um, so all we all we do for this is create a binary um, that will you know, execute a shell running as a super user, and we'll do that by doing our backdoor. We'll copy we'll copy our um, 
our backdoor into, into the kernel, start doing a set UID zero, and then we'll return back into user land, do an exec VE, and now we'll have a shell uh, running as root. Um, the code here I've talked about a bit earlier as well. Um, the arguments are completely wrong. Um, and now I'll go back to kernel stack smashing again. Um, like, okay, the, the important things I want to get across in the exploitation part. Um, we have a, the kernel shell code does not have to live in the kernel. Kernel shell code can live in user space, um, in user land, running you know, in the kernel context. Uh, so if we put our kernel shell code that does things like set UID zero, um, that escapes a CH root, escapes a jail, um, so long as the kernel is you know, in our user land segment, um, running you know, in the kernel context, we essentially have a, you know, the kernel running. Um, so we don't need to know addresses within the kernel. We can point it directly back to user space and control it all from user space. That's pretty much the reason why we don't need addresses. Uh, we control user space completely. We can control all addresses in user space pretty much. Um, we can mmap code to anywhere we want. Um, we can return, uh, if we overwrite the return address um, in a kernel stack to point to our user land code, we essentially have a kernel stack overflow uh, where we control you know, the address, um, the address of this. At this point, back in our you know, controlled user land environment running in kernel context, we can escalate privileges to a set UID zero by looking at our, our kernel stack, uh, looking at our task structure, changing the UID to zero, changing the GID to zero, and then at that point, we'll just return back to user land context. Um, again, user land totally under our control, um, and we can just return to another part of our, um, our user land program that does an exec VE that now is running uh, a shell uh, with UID zero. Uh, okay, so this essentially is kernel shell code um, without uh, using offsets or addresses. Um, it requires the address of our, uh, our kernel, our shell code in the sense that um, uh, what, where we want user land to return, where we want the kernel to return to user land. So shell code in this example would do something like execute a shell running as UID zero. Um, but this is essentially, is it, um, the, top of the, the top of the code here just grabs the current task structure, um, and then uh, from this we override our UID and GID with zero, um, and then after that we just return back into user land. Um, that essentially uh, is, is our shell code there. Okay. I think I think I sort of screwed up the last bit of this presentation. It sort of sounded a bit, you know, a bit obscure, but hopefully, hopefully, um, people will get something out of it. I hope. Um, okay. So, one other thing about kernel stack smashing: sometimes it's not possible to overwrite the return address completely. Uh, say, for example, we have a stack overflow in the kernel, uh, and we can only overwrite the least significant byte or the most significant byte of the return address. If we control the most significant byte, uh, we'll essentially return um, probably back into somewhere that we can control. We can mmap um, you know, a lot of things. We can mmap code anywhere in user land. We can, for i386 Linux, anywhere below 0xc, you know, 00, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, anywhere below that. So all we want to do is return somewhere into an area that we can control. Uh, if we control the least significant byte of return address, Maybe we can get it to return to another instruction that's already in the kernel that trampolines to somewhere in user land again. Um, like, this is very likely actually. It seems that, you know, can we find an instruction that trampolines back into user land? Um, remember that all we're looking for is a jump, a call, something that can get us, you know, into three gig of accessible memory. Um, that's all we want. And at that point, we can execute. We can execute code running in the, in the kernel context. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think I've been really confusing in that last part, but yeah. So, what future work um, should be done here? Um, I haven't actually written uh, exploitation for SE Linux or UML um, to escape the sandboxing. I think that's something um, that I really do need to do. <laughs> um, okay. There are a lot of he um, heat bugs uh, with kernel memory allocators. I, uh, I think this is uh, more future work than on this, you know, buffer overflows, double freeze, and so forth. Uh, something that I wanted to talk about, I suppose, uh, remote exploits. Uh, I've not actually seen any remote exploits in the, in the stuff that I've audited. I have seen some bugs in things like uh, the Coda distributed file system for Linux. 
Um, and certainly there have been bugs in the past for the IP fragmentation code in, in most kernels. Um, if I had to take a guess of, of where we would have bugs, um, and I, I do believe that there are bugs in a, uh, the TCP IP stacks that are remotely exploitable. Um, IP fragmentation code, um, the current Linux, I do believe, has a, um, a bug in the fragmentation code. I was looking at this a couple of weeks ago, and it seems, um, which is, I have no idea why. Um, when you have, Linux believes that when you have overlapping fragments, you should actually try to fix them. Um, and that's a really bad idea in my opinion. Um, so when you have two fragments, uh, and the first fragment overlaps the second fragment completely, um, it will delete the second fragment. And it will say, okay, the first fragment is authoritative, uh, ignore the second fragment. However, if the first fragment not only overlaps the next fragment, but also the one after that, Linux will say, okay, delete the second fragment, but leave the third one and the first one there. So you'll end up with uh, two fragments that are overlapping. Um, and at that point, it will go to the reassembly code. And I'm not quite sure what happens at that point. I haven't looked into that. Um, and it's something that I should do in the future. Um, I think the IP options code also is a, certainly a, a great place to look for bugs, uh, TCP options code as well. Uh, at one point, uh, there was a bug posted to the Linux kernel mailing list uh, with an IP options bug. And basically, instead of filling the padding um, of the IP options with uh, end of option, it would actually just overwrite the single byte with, IP, you know, it would overwrite the single byte and just ignore everything else. And after that, there was a bit of a, a rumor, you know, about, you know, is there a bug in the IP options code? Um, a bit of talk on full disclosure and so forth. Um, I think maybe this was related to someone reading the Linux kernel mailing list and saying maybe there's other bugs as well. Um, the IP options code is like is quite hairy. Um, I think maybe there might be things to do, uh, for example, if you um, have options and fragmentation together, so you might be able to f have a, an IP uh, packet and fragment it and fragment the options um, so that your options might overwrite um, some adjacent bytes with their shouldn't. There might be also some bugs uh, locally with the options passing code, uh, the options creation code, sorry. Um, and also probably another place to look for bugs is kernel interfacing, um, the interface within the network layer. Um, it's, you know, it's a good class of, you know, everyone generally has interfacing problems uh, when you have a lot of developers working on something. So that's probably another place to look for bugs as well. Um, if it was, if there were actually um, things like overflows uh, remotely, uh, one possible way of uh, exploitation uh, would be simply to push um, shell code into a user land process. Uh, that's all the kernel would do. Um, there's probably you know a million ways to do this, but it seems like a, a very a very safe way. Uh, create some shell code that forks and does a connect back, um, and all the kernel does is find a process that's already running, running as a super user, push the shell code into that process, and when the process uh, continues running, it will fork and do a connect back in user land. So that seems to be a, a possible way of uh, doing a remote exploitation for that, which seems quite reliable as well. Um, you don't really need to uh, do any networking code uh, within the kernel um, and just use uh, regular user land code to do that. Okay, um, so that's pretty much it. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the presentation um, and if you want to talk to me afterwards, uh, feel free. Thank you.